Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is on the stroke of 9am, so we are off and flying. That is the accuracy for which AusCert is renowned. My name's Adam Spencer. I want to welcome you to the 18th AusCert Cyber Security Conference 2019, Australia's original and best cyber security conference. We're going to be packed to the gunnels today. People are going to keep walking in for a little while. So if it is easy for you to move across, shuffle across one seat and leave any vacancies on the aisle, feel free to do that because you don't want people clambering over you for our opening session. It's a thrill to welcome you here, but I want to start today. I'm really excited to welcome to the stage, to welcome us on behalf of the traditional owners of this land, an emerging leader of the Gold Coast. Can we please have a big round of applause for the wonderful Stacey Fogarty. I would like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to my elders past, present and emerging. Good morning, my name is Stacey Fogarty and I'm a Mullanjali woman from Badezit, which is about 60 kilometres west of where we are today. I am a traditional custodian of these lands and I'm connected to these lands through my blood, birth and my ancestors. This is my land and my family's land and on behalf of myself and my family, I'd love to welcome you all here this morning. Jingri, Minyago, Jingri Walo, Naniniri Stacey, Jingri Yugambe Jargon. Now, what I just said to you all in the local Yugambe language is welcome, hello, how are you? My name is Stacey and welcome to Yugambe country. It is tradition for Indigenous people to welcome other people into their land and in doing so, pay your respects to the elders on whose land you are standing on. We do a welcome to country because we, over, we have over 400 tribal borders sitting with inside what we call the Australia you see today. Respectfully, we would request permission to travel into another mob's country, permission to travel into another tribe's land, permission to travel into another family's land, and this tradition still continues today with my welcome for you all. If I can explain how this works in a non-Indigenous, non-traditional sense, I'm hosting a party tomorrow night and you're one of the invited guests. The way you would come to my party is you, would open, you wouldn't just come to my door, you wouldn't just, sorry, you wouldn't just knock on my front door and you wouldn't just walk into my house. You would have to wait for me to invite you in. You wouldn't just open my fridge, start eating my food and start drinking my drinks. You wouldn't do that, that would be disrespectful. So a welcome in traditional sense is how we operate today, which is when we go to someone's house, which you guys are in my house right now, you would come and knock on my door. I would answer the door and choose whether or not to let you in. If I didn't want you to come into my house, you would have to turn around and go away. But this morning, I'm going to welcome you all into my home. So now that you have permission to enter my house, open my fridge and start eating my food and drinking my drinks. If we hold that thought of what a welcome to country is, it is me opening my home and my land to you. In an Indigenous sense, an Aboriginal sense, in days gone by, not, by us, we have a similar fashion, but we didn't have a fridge, we didn't have a door, and we didn't have a mobile phone or anything like that. So you would go to the edge of your country and try to get the attention of the neighbouring people next door. One way we would get the attention of the neighbouring the neighbouring people next door would we would go to the border. The border between my land and the next person's land could have been a river, a stream, a set of trees or just a rock. And we would get to that rock and we would light a big fire. That fire would produce smoke and that smoke was a signal to the custodians, the owners of the land of which you wanted to get entry to, to say, hey, there's some people at the border, I think we should go over and see who it is. So the warriors or some of the men would go over to the border and light the fire and would basically say, hello, what do you want? And you would say, hey, I'd like to fish in your river. We know that the mullet is running now and we would like to come and hunt the mullet to feed our children. Do you give us permission to do this? The warriors would then take the message back to the leader of the tribe and pass those words on. It was up to the elder whether or not to let you in. So in this case, we've said yes. Then the warriors would return to your fire and say, you have permission to gain entry into our land and to fish the river for the mullet, but you must adopt our rules and our laws. And for you to come into and hunt our mullet, you can only bring in two warriors to come and fish. Whatever they carry is what you get to take home to feed your family. Respectfully, we would 100% obey the law. So if there were 10 men waiting at the fire, only two men would gain entry and the other eight would wait. The other two men would go in and fish and hunt until they got enough mullet they could carry and they would all leave together. So when I say I welcome you and I welcome you to the lands of the Yugambe people, I am welcome you to my home. I'm giving you permission to gain entry into my home, but they are under my rules and you respect those rules. 
So today, I respectfully welcome you all to Yugambeh country and to my family's country. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of your day. Nanyabu, see you soon. Thank you so much, Stacey, for that wonderful welcome to country. For our international guests in particular, I want you to understand that's more than just a quick chat about the rules about fishing for mullet. In Australia, we are, we're exceptionally proud of the fact that our Indigenous culture stretches back tens of thousands, possibly 60,000 years. So we thank our Indigenous forebears for their custodianship of the land upon which we meet today. For this, as I said, the 18th AusCert Cyber Security Conference. My name's Adam Spencer, really excited to be here with you again this year, uh, this time in human physical form. Some of you will remember last year I appeared as a robot. Uh, some of you will remember the bit where I didn't quite understand what I was doing and the robot fell off the stage. Very funny stuff. Tough crowd had to move on, but obviously some of you weren't. Some of you are here for the very first time. Quick show of hands if this is your first Ozzer conference. Give our newbies a big round of applause. Great to have you here, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I'm really excited to have you. If you're up the back of the room, please come and find seats. Plenty of seats down this end of the room in particular. A couple of little bits of housekeeping I has to race through before introducing our first speaker. In the unlikely event of an emergency, remain calm, follow the instructions of the well-trained staff. A public address announcement will happen in conjunction with the evacuation tone, whoop whoop, beep beep. The primary evacuation assembly area is in Acacia Avenue near the southern side of the hotel. Bathrooms, exit the room, turn left and left again, halfway down the gallery side. Phones, out of respect for the presenters, please turn your phones to mobile, uh, off or onto silent. Uh, I like to say at events like this, we've got enough breaks during the course of the day, just look up, free yourself on the screens and soak up what's going on here on the stage. I accept in this group, that's a bigger challenge than it is in some. But if you can break away from the screens, the presentations we've got here today are quite amazing. Most of you should have installed the conference app by now. You use that for rating the presentations check in at each booth during the passport to win prizes and all that sort of stuff. And we're particularly excited the good people at Context are hosting a Pwn to Drone Challenge. Now, the objective of this challenge is to allow participants to try their skills in controlled, semi-representative industrial control systems, which include a fully functioning SCADA network, including controllable traffic lights, smart meters, pump water storage, simulated smoke fire effects. Once players have compromised the network from the IT DMZ propagating through the operational technology network, possible to compromise and capture. I've got no idea what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> as often happens for me at OzCert, most of the individual words in that paragraph make sense to me. They have been placed together in an order that render them gibberish. But I'm told it's a rocking challenge. Get along to the S10 context booth, have a chat with them. Make sure you go to the registration desk and collect your shirt and bag. The interactive zone, as always, goes off at OzCert. The Lego booth where you can build your own minifigs and the lock picking village, one of the real highlights of OzCert, try a hand, pick up a lock picking set and try and bust some of the locks down there. Throughout the next couple of days, our hashtag for social media is OzCert2019. Take photos, get images, quotable quotes, everything that's going on, capture the conversation and get it out there on your social media of choice. We don't care what it is. Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, Tinder, we don't care. Get it out there and let everyone know how much fun we are having at OzCert 2019. This event is completely sold out. So can we have a round of applause for the organisers? Congratulations, guys. This is just wonderful. It does mean that tonight's gala dinner is absolutely packed to the gunnels with an extensive waiting list. So if for some reason during the day you realise you can't now make it to the gala dinner, do us a massive favour, go and tell them at the registration desk that your seat will be empty because there's someone else who desperately wants to sit in that seat. We're moments away from our opening keynote, but now to welcome us on behalf of OzCert and let us know what the next couple of days have in store, please welcome David Stockdale and Mike Home. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much, Adam, and Thanks, thank you man. very much to Stacey as well for the welcome to country. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the, of the land on which we meet and pay my respect to elders, both past, present and emerging. So my name is David Stockdale. I'm the director of OzCert. It's dangerous to go alone. What do we mean? What are we doing? Well, it is dangerous. It, uh, cyber security is a, it's a phrase that's coming out as a team sport. We need to act together. So what's OzCert doing for you? There's a lot of cyber threats that are emerging. It's, it's evolving very quickly. What does OzCert actually do for you? Well, we're investing. We're investing big time. We're investing in your people, in the processes, and in the technology as well. And what do I mean by that? It's investing in empowering your people through the training that we're going to be offering. 
It's investing to enhance your capability through our defined processes. That's our threat intelligence, and, that, and that's our incident response services. And we're expanding your capacity through, the, through our technology integration with our MIST platforms, with our integration with, our, with vendor products from our services. So that's what we're doing to try to make sure that you're not alone. To hear more about this, I'd like to introduce Mike Holm, the Operations Manager for CERT, to talk a little bit about this. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Now, that theme wasn't actually chosen just for its retro gaming coolness. Um, we're, we were actually trying to encourage a, a balanced information security program, um, hence the uh, you know, defense in depth strategy, everything that we've all learned. Um, but it sort of ties in really nicely with um, don't go it alone. So what does that mean for us? It doesn't mean that we're here to replace any government departments or anything like that, government agencies. It doesn't mean we're here to replace any of those vendors out there. It's quite different. We're actually very passionate about delivering world-class cybersecurity services that are unique, and we want to do it at a not-for-profit rate. So that's why we're all here. That's why everyone works in OSCERT. Um, the, we're actually, at, at the moment, we're very excited about planning what we're doing next year. So you know, you've got to look ahead. Um, so what we really want from you, um, from our members, is we want you to come and visit our booth. So our booth is sort of at the intersection of the, the two aisleways. And throughout the whole conference, the next two days, um, our wonderful membership team, Nick and Megan, will be there. So uh, they've actually got a, a short survey that we would really like you to, um, to complete. It's, it's just asking, you know, what are you using in our services? What do you want from our services going forward? So we'd really love it if you could, if you could participate in that. Um, during the breaks, um, also, our analysts will be at the stand. Um, so if you want to actually talk to any of the analysts, um, just come and find us at morning tea, afternoon tea, and lunch. Um, okay, speaking of, of our members, uh, we're actually really proud to say that an, an quite a number of our members have been able to integrate our services into their business processes, because that's what this is all about, obviously. It's not just technology anymore. We've, as David said, we've got to think of people, process, technology. So uh, one of the examples of that is the Information Sharing and Analysis Centre that we, we've operated now for a little while for the universities. Um, we actually just got uh, a finalist stat status in the Cordit Awards last week for that. Um, we're extremely proud of, of Nick Soysers, one of our um, senior analysts who's, who heads up that ISAC, but we're really proud of the whole team because to actually get that recognition for that ISAC was just wonderful. Um, the Victorian government had already put all of, all of our membership services into their business processes for their information security management program, but the next thing they did is they've rolled out our new training across all of their uh, state departments so that everyone can benefit from OSERT's expertise. And we were really excited about that too. Um, so I suppose it's, it's really good to see that it's, it, it isn't just about the tech anymore, it is about the people, and that's where, where that training came in. All right, so that brings me to something I've been really looking forward to doing, and that is launching a whole lot of new products. So David has already hinted at it, I just hinted at it, we're now doing training again. So um, what we're going to do is over the next month or so, we'll launch that officially, and we'll get all the information out to our members about the courses that we're offering. So there's things like, um, obviously, incident response, that's kind of a cert team's bread and butter. So we're obviously very keen to impart our knowledge on that. But we've also done some courses on planning your incident response. Um, now, that's, that might sound like a, a, a bit of a, an overlap, but it's actually not. You've got to plan these things in advance. So uh, those courses will be announced really, uh, really soon, so over the next month or so. Um, the next thing I wanted to announce is something that we've all been very excited about internally, and we've got a few of you on the pilot for this, and that's our OSERT Daily Intelligence Report. Um, I found before I worked in OSERT where I was surrounded by um, analysts that know everything that's going on all the time in cybersecurity news, I felt like uh, when I worked in a bank, I felt like I was in a bit of a vacuum. I didn't really know what was going on in the world. So it was really refreshing to see all the analysts talking about all these InfoSec news articles. And we sort of looked at that and we went, well, our members probably want to hear that too. So it's now a daily report that you can subscribe to. In a couple of weeks, you'll just be able to switch it on in our member portal. Um, at the moment, if you want to 
enable it immediately. If you can't wait for that, you can just see our membership team and they'll turn it on in your, in your um, email subscriptions. And it's just a daily report of some curated news articles that our analysts thought would be relevant to you. So that was exciting. And uh, the very last thing I want to mention um, I mentioned we're doing an ISAC for the university, so the ISAC is Information Sharing and Analysis Centre. Um, that was something that we stole from the, the US. A lot, of, uh, a lot of good ideas come from there in the cybersecurity space and they're miles ahead of us. So we, we've actually used, uh, we've got it done, uh, done a little bit differently. We're using MISP for the technology behind that. And those of you that have looked at the program, you'll notice that we've actually got the guys from Circle, which is the team that, that um, writes the, the software behind MISP. We've actually got them here at the conference again. There's a couple of them here, did some tutorials in the last couple of days. And there's presentations today and tomorrow from them as well. So we wanted to be able to get that expertise out to you so that you can learn from it. But most importantly, we're actually going to, uh, for all of our members, we're going to launch the MISP service so that you can subscribe to it and you can receive the giant flow of indicators of compromise that, that comes out of a MISP feed. So over the next couple of weeks, we'll announce, um, we, we do have to charge you for that. I, I said that we're not for profit, but um, it obviously there's, a, there's an internal cost to us to producing that information. It's a very highly focused, um, curated, high confidence feed of, of information. And uh, that obviously doesn't come for free. So we'll announce what the pricing is for that over the next month or so. And we're very, very excited about launching these three new products. So, I'm going to stop talking now and hand back to Dr. David. Um, we're going to go a little bit further through the journey of people process technology. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Mike. It's really exciting. I feel very, um, very lucky to be uh, director of OzCert, but I'm, I'm quite fortunate also to have two, a foot in two, in, or two feet in different camps. Uh, OzCert is part of the University of Queensland, but I also have a role within the University of Queensland. So, the, the theme of not going alone, uh, what is also doing for you? Well, we've covered some of that, the, some of that, uh, that stuff today with our proce people, processes, and technology. But it's not just about what university, what OSCERT is doing, but it's also about what the University of Queensland is also going to do. And it's my great pleasure to invite Professor Ryan Coe, the chair and the director of UQ Cybersecurity, to the stage to talk about the up and coming cybersecurity initiative. Thank you. Um, very good morning to you. Uh, it's an honor to be here amongst all the cybersecurity experts here. I want to find out how many of you are from the industry. Can you raise your hands? And how many are from the government? And how many of you are currently not awake and need some coffee right now? <laughs> yeah, um, it's, I'm very honored to actually be part of this UQ cybersecurity program. The whole goal of this UQ cybersecurity program is that in a few years time, all of you who, who have raised your hands are gonna be part of this UQ cybersecurity network. Why am I saying that? It's because one of the problems is that we always have industry, um, academic research, and education and training in silos or in different parts of the, the ecosystem. And one of the challenges is actually to bring them together. So as you can see from, from this perspective, the University of Queensland has invested in a program which actually brings everyone together. OSCERT and its members, UQ's ITS with its SOC, the industry, government, and international organizations like the Interpol, ISO, NIST, and so on. Together with all the researchers from our different faculties, the engineering, architecture, uh, an IT faculty with the School of ITEE, the science uh, with the math and physics, um, you know, the mathematicians and the physicists uh, who are working on the quantum computing, the post-quantum uh, crypto and so on, the humanities, arts and social science faculty uh, who are working on the different social aspects and the challenges of cybersecurity, and the business, economics and law faculty uh, working on the business governance, uh, the economical decision making, the legal aspects of cybersecurity, medicine coming together to understand from the psychology perspective, even for the health information systems, the data privacy and so on, the Center for Policy Futures covering the national security and the policies, 
and we have the Institute for Social Science Research, which supports the HASS, and also, of course, yeah, coming together. And as Mike alluded to, it's dangerous to go alone, and David as well mentioned that. So we're all coming together, and together with OSCERT, we are actually offering a lot of continuing professional development courses, a master's program, PhDs, and so on. So that's in a nutshell how we are proposing to work together, and it is my dream, at least, to see all of you as part of UQ Cybersecurity. If you come by our booth, you might get a UQ Cybersecurity sticker, right? So I'll see you at the booth then. Thank you very much. Yeah. Did I hear you right, Ryan? A free sticker? <laughs> Game on at the UQ desk. No, don't go there. It's a fascinating initiative. Find out exactly what's going on. Speak to them over the course of the next couple of days. Now, our people at the back, we're about to have our first keynote. If you want to just come in subtly and find there's some great seats right down the front here in particular while I'm doing our intro of our next keynote speaker, a globally known tech security guru, Ted Speaker, Chief Research Officer of F Secure. He's written on research from the New York Times, Wired, Scientific America. He's been on international TV, a nine-page profile in Vanity Fair, if you don't mind. Selected among the 50 most important people on the web by PC World magazine, included in the FP Global 100 Thinkers list. He's a member of the board of the Nordic Business Forum, probably my favourite business forum worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the man, our opening keynote speaker. Please, a big round of applause for Mikko Hibbenen. Thank you, Adam. Good morning, my name is Mikko. And yes, I am a geek and a nerd. And yes, I do live in Helsinki, which is in Finland, which is in Europe. And I have been doing InfoSec all my life. I'll be 50 years old this year, so that's a pretty long time to be working with computer security. But it's not just me which is turning 50 this year. If you've uh, read about the history of uh, ARPANET, you do recall that uh, the historic first packets ever sent over uh, ARPANET, which then became the internet, were logged by hand into this IMB logbook, which had an entry on the 29th of October 1969, saying that the first message was successfully sent from one machine to another on a network which then became what we today know as the internet. That's a pretty big deal. Now, internet obviously didn't become an overnight success. It became the thing that we know today with utilities and applications that we could all use. I guess, most importantly, the web. And the web isn't 50 years old. The web is 30 years old, although for most of us, it's 25 years old, because the web really became mainstream in 1994. 1994, 1995. I set up the first website for our company in April 1994. And I remember that there were 16 websites in our country. We were website number 17. That's, that's how early days it was. But the change from the web then was very, very fast. The world changed. The world changed during our lifetime. What internet did was it took away borders. Borders, distance, and geography disappeared. Disappeared in a good way and, well, the reason why we're here, in a bad way. Now, obviously, we had computer security problems before the internet. You know, things spreading on floppy disks. You might remember these. Viruses which would infect boot sectors of five and quarter inch floppy disks or three and a half inch floppy disks and would go around the world as people would travel and physically carry these on themselves. Those were a real problem, but obviously when you look at the speed of spreading in the hindsight from those, it's nothing to compare to what happened then when email became commonplace and then eventually web became such a big deal that we could have things like you know, exploit kits and phishing sites and things like that. 
And now the web and the internet and applications and mobile phones are such an integrated part of our everyday lives, it's hard to remember how it was. So, let's talk about Austria. A couple of months ago, I had a chat with a colleague at the office, a young guy, maybe 25 years old, one of the young coders we've recruited from university, who had just come back from a business trip in Vienna, Austria. And we chatted about Austria, and I mentioned to him about this holiday that I took to Austria when I was his age, like around 1992, 1993. Me and a couple of friends went to Austria, we rented a car, we drove to the Alps where we had pre-booked a boat which we rented and we went sailing on a, on a lake in the middle of the Alps. And then this young coder asked me, how did you actually do that? Like, how, 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 did, you, how did you plan all that? How did you find where you want to go, how did you rent the boat, how did you rent the car, where did you find boat rental places before the internet, because this was before the internet, web wasn't there. And I was baffled, I had no idea, I, I, I absolutely couldn't recall how, how we did this before the internet, but we did. And I really had to like think back and try to remember like how did things work before the internet. I, and I, I guess I called international dial assistance, which is a number that you used to call where there was a lady with phone books for different countries. And you would ask her that, hey, I'm looking for boat rental places in Austria. And she would pick Austrian yellow pages and try to find things and give you numbers. And then you would call those places with my school German to pre-book a boat. And then, of course, when we rented the car, there is no GPS, there is no mobile phone. It seems like ancient history, and this is 25 years ago. World is changing fast. Changing for the better, mostly. But also, in some ways, changing for the worst. Before the internet, we only had to worry about the criminals who were living close to us. That's it. Now we have to worry about criminals who can be anywhere on the planet. That's the downside. Now, don't get me wrong. There's much more good upsides than downsides that the internet has brought us, but it has changed, for the first time, the risk ratio of an average person that he is now more likely to become a victim of a crime in the online world than the real world. And that's a pretty big shift, and it's happening right now. So, one thing that I keep wondering about myself is that after all the lessons that we've learned in computer security about, about how to make better and more secure systems, how to build security at every layer of new developments, how come we keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again? In many ways, when you look at some computer security, everything old is new again. We keep running into the same problems. Let me give you an example. This is the AIDS Information Trojan from 1989. 1980s. A ransom Trojan from 1980s. For real. Yes, this was a ransom Trojan. It was distributed on a floppy because internet didn't exist. People were mailed this floppy which claimed to be a useful application. When you installed it, after a couple of days, it would encrypt the hard drive and show you a ransom note. Like this. In 1989. Compare that to Petya, which is one of the most well-known current ransom trojans. It's almost exactly the same thing, except, of course, in 1989, it wasn't asking for Bitcoin. It was asking you to do a wire transfer to a P.O. box in Panama. Nevertheless, everything old is new again. Another example. Many of you remember macroviruses, 1999, 2000, 2001, love letter, nuclear, LaRue infecting Word, Excel, PowerPoint spreading over macros. We got rid of this problem because Microsoft changed the way Microsoft Office works. They disabled macros by default to get rid of the macrovirus problem. They did this in Microsoft Office 2003, a long time ago, 16 years ago. 
And now when we look at the problems we're seeing today, we're seeing macro viruses or macro malware again. And the same default setting that was changed in 2003 is still there. Macros are disabled by default, which means today the attacks try to trick you into clicking the most dangerous button that you have in Microsoft Office, the Enable Content button, which is the button that they introduced in 2003. If there are macros in the file you open, they are disabled, but they will helpfully prompt you if you might want to enable them anyway. And now the, the attacks are trying to trick you into clicking that button, which sounds pretty innocent. It's enabling content. So I have friends who work at Microsoft. Actually, I have friends who work in the Microsoft Office team, and I've told them that they should rename the button to infect my system. <laughs> because then, maybe then, people wouldn't be so keen on clicking on that. So yes, everything old is new again. We keep repeating the same mistakes. Another example, Telnet. Unencrypted terminal connection from one machine to another, which, mean, which means anybody who's watching the traffic sees everything. It's unencrypted. So if you're doing the Telnet session over Wi-Fi, anybody who's there will get your passwords or whatever you type. Such a horribly bad idea. We got rid of Telnet in the 1990s. And now when you look where we are today with this brave new world of Internet of Things and connected devices, for some reason that I cannot explain, we are reintroducing Telnet as a service on these devices, most of which are running Linux, so they are Unix systems, same kind of systems which we got rid of Telnet D in 1995 or 1997. When we look at the botnets that we are now seeing, which only infect IoT devices, which refuse to infect real computers, many of those are using Telnet as the way in, most famously Mirai, which actually has a built-in built -in list of Telnet usernames and passwords. It tries to gain access, like admin, admin, support, support, root, root, all my favorite motherfucker. <laughs> I don't really know why it tries logging in as mother and password as but it does. Maybe there is a system somewhere which this is the default password. So yes, we keep repeating the same mistakes. And to make this harder, when we, when we succeed in our work, nothing happens. That's a pretty, pretty big downer, actually. When we are successful, nothing happens. Like, if you do your job right, your company and your clients will not be on the cover of the newspaper tomorrow. Because there never is a newspaper which would have headlined that, you know, the biggest company in Australia was not hacked yesterday. That's not news. And I sometimes end up in discussions over this, because I, I do a lot of meetings with F-Secure's clients and customers, typically, you know, board meetings or leadership team meetings. And it's typically the CFO who looks at the figures and he's like, hmm, we're paying you guys, it says here, we're paying you guys 50,000 euros a year. Why are we paying you guys 50,000 euros a year? We have no security problems. And what I typically reply with is that, well, you know what, Mr. CFO? It's awfully clean here in your boardroom. Why don't you fire all your cleaners and janitors? Clearly you don't need them. So when we do our jobs right, we're invisible. But when we fail, it is very visible. And today, as more and more of our systems and services are moving from traditional on-prem systems into the cloud, this is becoming more and more important because we are becoming service providers. Every company already became a software company five years ago. That's old news. Every company is a software company. Your company, regardless of what you do, is a software company. What's happening now is that every company is becoming a software service provider. We are becoming cloud providers for our customers. 
And that means that when we fail, it's not just that we have problems internally, it's that our clients and customers have problems. And we have plenty of examples of this happening in different countries over and over again. Plenty of examples from this year where uh, service providers or software as a service providers are unable to provide the service because their cloud instances have been wiped by a ransomware Trojan, which got in because a clerk in the financial department clicked on an Excel attachment they got over email. And I'll tell you what, that's no longer good enough. The fact that someone opened a bad spreadsheet should never be the reason that your customers can't work. But that's exactly what has happened over and over again over the last months. We're becoming service providers. And it is a game of cat and mouse. Whatever new safety precautions we are implementing, the attackers are watching and trying to figure out ways to get around them. So things like moving our email servers from our own hosted servers into cloud, let's say Office 365, only means that the attackers will follow from the on-prem systems into the cloud systems. So we introduce new safety precautions like two-factor authentication with SMS-based auth or even better application or authenticator-based authentication and the attackers will follow. Let's have a look at a real attack from not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago. You get an email, a file has been shared with you, please follow the link, you follow the link, you end up in OneDrive, which is where you have files anyway, because your organization is running Office 365, and it asks you to authenticate to gain access to the file. Now, so you take a look at the URL, because that's what you've been trained to do, and there is the lock, all right, great. But you know that the lock itself isn't good enough. But then you look at the URL, and it is office.com, which is a Microsoft domain. And this is a Microsoft login. Hmm. And it's asking for your username. It's asking for your password. Now, obviously, it's a phishing site, because forms.office.com is a forms hosting site where anybody can create forms, like a form which says, OneDrive, sign in to continue. Please give your username. But beyond that, it's also a man-in-the-middle attack, because when you give this form a real username and real password, it will take them and immediately use them to log in to the real Office 365, which then triggers, the real Office 365 server triggers a two-factor authentication query. And this, of course, means that the real user gets a real notification on the real device, which makes perfect sense because he or she is really logging into a service, or so they believe. So they will, of course, punch in the uh, code that they just received. And attacks like these are hard to fight as long as we keep using authentication mechanisms which are relying on the users being able to tell the difference between a real URL or a bad URL, when URLs can look so confusing office.com. It's hard to tell your users that don't trust content from office.com, is it? And yes, everything is becoming a computer. If it uses electricity, it will become a computer. I'm not worried about IoT revolution of smart devices. That doesn't worry me at all. What I am worried about is stupid devices. Stupid devices going to the internet. And this hasn't happened yet. We have right now a revolution where you go and buy a smart watch, a smart car, smart TV. And when you as a consumer buy those things, you know that they are on the internet. That's why you bought them. You bought the smart TV so you could watch Netflix on the TV. It's obvious that it's on the internet. You know that it's on the internet. But in the near future, stupid devices will go on the internet as well. And you have no idea that they are on the internet. Because they will not be going to the internet to provide 
new features and services to you, the consumer, they will be going to the internet to provide benefits to the manufacturer. So simple, simple stupid household items will be going to the internet just for the reason that the manufacturers want to know where their clients are. How often do they use these devices? How often do they have failures? Which means when you go and buy devices in the future, you are not even told that they are going to go to the internet. And they will not be going to the internet using a Wi-Fi connection that you could block. They will be going to the internet using 5G or Zigfox or something that you can't block. Now, there's nothing we can do to prevent this. This revolution is already underway. You can't stop this revolution from refusing to play part because you will play part. Because you won't even know which of the devices you will buy will be on the internet. This revolution hasn't gone through yet because it's still too expensive to add an IoT chipset or a Sigfox chipset and, a, well, eventually a 5G modem into every device. But as you know, technology becomes cheaper and cheaper. In 10 years, it's going to be so cheap, connectivity can be put into anything. And then it will. And this revolution has been a long time coming. IoT and connected devices really started from factories and plants. Factory automation companies started building plant automation systems, computerized plant automation systems, already in the 1980s. Today, every factory, every plant, every power plant, every nuclear power plant, every food processing plant runs on computers. Our society runs on computers. And we got an excellent reminder of this seven weeks ago in this facility, which belongs to Norsk Hydro, which is the second largest company in Norway. One of the largest aluminum manufacturers in the world with factories around the world, including aluminum factories in Qatar and in Brazil. And on the Tuesday morning, seven weeks ago, when employees got to their office, there was a handwritten note at every office door which says, do not turn on your computer. There's a note at the bottom which has an added note an hour later that it's okay to turn on your phone, but don't turn on your computer. And the, if this ever happens to you, this is a bad sign. <laughs> this was Locker Goga. There's two similar gangs going, or, going around now with ransom Trojans, Locker Goga and Mega Cortex. And these ransom Trojans are different from the ones we used to know, like Crypto Wall and Crypto Locker or WannaCry and Petya, because these things do not spread. They are not worms. They're not viruses. They are targeted. The attackers, the gangs, will pick a company. Then they start scanning the perimeter, trying to find ways in, typically looking for VPN endpoints or OWA sites or some way in. And once they gain access, then they use lateral movement, trying to gain access to everything, going from one data center to another. And once they are happy with the level of access they have, once they believe that they can destroy everything in one go, that's what they do. In this case, in the middle of the night, between Monday and Tuesday, all the data centers went down. They were wiped with a very fast encryption algorithm, which tried deleting everything or encrypting everything. And then, when they were done, they were not asking for Bitcoin. No. They simply left their contact information. Here's our email. Please get in touch. Let's negotiate. That's what they do. And this is a different beast. This is a different kind of a problem than the traditional random malware, which would then use encryption mechanisms to strike a ransom Trojan attack against your organizations, because these are targeted. And the ransom Trojan problem really plays on a very old idea that we've seen for years and years with cyber criminals. 
the old idea that you steal information and then you sell that information to the highest bidder. This is what cyber criminals have been doing for years and years. Well, it's exactly the same idea in ransom trojans. It's just that the attackers realize that in many cases, the highest bidder is the victim themselves. They are willing to pay more for the data than anyone else. So if you can destroy the data and make sure they can't restore it or recover it in a timely fashion, they will pay you the ransom. And when this hit the news, initially it looked really, really worrying because this is aluminum manufacturing. And if you know anything about aluminum manufacturing, and I didn't know anything about it before this, these factories are very, very fragile. They run 24 hours a day. Basically, you build an aluminum factory, you boot it up, and then it never stops. Because if you have to stop it, you will lose the factory. Aluminum melts in, and you will never be able to recover it. Sounds like theoretical. This has actually happened. The last time this has happened, it was in February in Venezuela, as government of Venezuela has been having extended power cuts, after which, as a result of which they lost all of their aluminum factories, and they will be without any capability to make any aluminum for at least a year. However, with this company, it didn't happen. We know that they had to take all of their computing systems offline, including the PLCs controlling their factories. But they didn't, didn't lose a single factory. They were able to keep every factory operating without computers. How the hell do you do that? How on earth do you keep a modern factory running without computers? Well, the answer is they were able to do it because they still had these. You know, old farts who remember how it used to be. <laughs> Basically guys like me. Basically guys like me who travels the world carrying floppy disks and uh, Punch cards. You remember these? This is how we used to store information. You want a punch card? Here we go. They're, they're cheap. They're cheap. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Don't put them on eBay. So, these guys still remembered how it used to be. How factories used to operate before we had PLCs, before we had computers, who still had binders full of papers with calculations and numbers. This is what saved these particular factories. Now the question is, how much longer will we be able to do this? Five years? Ten years? Not much longer. And everything is becoming a computer. Everything turns into a computer. And some of these devices that are turning into computers have very, very long life cycles. I think a prime example is cars. You look, look at the car that you would buy today Clearly, it's a computer. A modern car is a data center on four wheels. So how long is that new car that you buy today going to be on the roads? If it's not crashed, it's going to be on the roads for, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years, maybe. Maybe. I'm right now driving a 19-year-old car. I plan on driving it for at least 10 more years. But as they are now cars, then the question becomes, how long will these data centers be getting patches? You know, security patches. So I asked my Twitter followers, and the consensus was that car manufacturers should be providing patches for their cars for 25 years. 25 years. Right now, nobody's providing security patches for anything for more than 15 years, typically more than five years. The only exception seems to be Windows XP, which simply refuses to die. <laughs> and when we look at the situation right now, people are really getting over-the-air updates to their cars as they're driving around. But will they be getting the patches when the car is 25 years old? We really don't know. We don't know if this is going to be supportable. Everything is becoming a computer. Some of these things have very long life cycles, and we have no idea how the patches will be handled when the device is going to be 20, 30, 40 years old. 
And we, of course, all know about the patching which is right now underway for these 737 MAX 8. When the patches for these will be ready, I wonder if they are also going to be over-the-air patches. Sometimes we are developing new technology and we fall in love with the technology. We innovate something great and we deploy and implement it everywhere only to realize decades later that it was a horribly bad idea. Let me play you a TV ad from 1950s. Smart woman, she's putting a new floor down by herself. Wise woman, she's using Kentile Vinyl Asbestos Tile. Easiest flooring to install, easiest flooring to care for. Save every way with Kentile Vinyl Asbestos Tile. Kentile Vinyl Asbestos Tiles. Best idea ever, asbestos. Let's just put it everywhere, like, you know, kitchen tiles and paint and insulation and pipes and whatever. Well, as asbestos was a great idea. It was a really remarkable, really revolutionary material with great, great benefits, which turned out to be a horribly bad idea. And what's happening right now around us could eventually turn out to be IT asbestos. Yeah, let's turn everything into a computer. Let's put everything on the internet. Let's take these horribly insecure IoT devices running Linux with a kernel from early 2000s and a built-in password which cannot be changed by the customer and just deploy them globally. That's what we're doing today. And in 10, 15, 20 years, we'll be looking back at these years and scratching our heads that what the hell were we thinking? What we are creating right now could be the next big headache that we have to worry about for the upcoming decades. IT asbestos, mark my words. And then we have a totally different set of problems ahead of us in the future as we think about what's happening with governments. Now, most organizations do not have to worry about governmental attacks. But some organizations do. And by the way, take a look at these guys' march. That's pretty neat. I've seen your military march. It doesn't look like this. It doesn't look like this at all. So three weeks ago, a lawyer in London got a phone call in the middle of the night. Actually, three calls, missed calls, because he was asleep and the phone was silent. When he woke up in the morning, he picked up the phone, an iPhone, looked at it, and okay, three missed calls. From a phone number which starts with plus four six, and that's the country code for Sweden. The lawyer was in London, he's like, hmm, weird. And they weren't phone calls, they were video calls. Video calls over WhatsApp. And those calls in the middle of the night to a human rights lawyer in London three weeks ago were the reason why you got a patch for your phones. And the attack that was targeting that human rights lawyer was launched by an Israeli company who was targeting, well, if not Mr. Jamal Khashoggi himself, at least his personal friends, after which this journalist was brutally murdered by the Saudi Arabian government. So why was this company, Israeli company, targeting a human rights lawyer in London with WhatsApp zero-day vulnerability? Well, because he was running civil litigation against the company from people who had been targeted by rogue governments like the Saudi government trying to gain access to their mobile phones with unknown exploits. And cases like these are rare. And this was deployment with zero-day vulnerability. Our statistics on how many times during a year we see a real attack against real users using a zero-day vulnerability, there's like 20 or 30 attacks like that every year. It's, it's rare because zero days are rare and zero days are valuable. Attackers don't like to use them because then you lose them. 
This particular attack means that all of us got a WhatsApp update last week. And if you haven't updated your WhatsApp, you should. Although it's not really obvious why you should. If you look at the release notes for the patch at Packstick, it doesn't speak anything about the zero-day vulnerability. It speaks about new stickers. Nevertheless, update your WhatsApp. So the nature of conflict around us is changing. We used to be fighting traditional wars for thousands of years. Wars where we were fighting each other with bow and arrows and swords. But technology has always been shaping the face of conflict and the face of war. As we got good enough technology to take the war to seas, we did by building warships, creating air, uh, sea war and then air war. Technology shapes how we fight. But the innovation of sea war and air war did not take land war away. Conflict just expands into new domains. Then we got satellites and shit, which means space war. And now we got cyberspace war. And if you look at a modern conflict like, let's say, Russia, Ukraine, they are fighting that war in every single domain. Land, air, sea, space, and cyberspace. And this will not be the end of domains where we can fight. There will be new domains, like, I don't know, one day robots will be doing the fighting, or uh, we will be fighting DNA warfare, or, uh, I don't know, nano for warfare, which sounds like science fiction today, but then again, so did cyber war sound like science fiction just a couple of decades ago. And then I suppose eventually we will end up with machine learning and AI-based conflict. And you don't have to believe me on that. You can take that from uh, President Putin. Liderum veto sfere, stanet liderum mira. Who is the leader in AI will lead the world. The good news is that right now, today, machine learning is basically only used by the good guys. It's not yet being used by bad guys. Security companies, including everyone, every single security company here, will tell you about how they use machine learning to build defenses. And we aren't really yet seeing attackers doing that. But that's going to change as well. Eventually, deployment of machine learning and AI systems will become so easy to use that any idiot will be able to use them. And then we will start seeing self-morphing malware which learns, or phishing attacks using machine learning tactics. All of these will happen. Hasn't happened yet, but it will. So criminals are different from governments. Criminals go after the low-hanging fruit. When criminals try to gain access to your network, they're not really after you. They're after money. If it's too hard, too slow, too expensive to gain access to your network, they will go after an easier target. And believe me, the internet is a garden of low-hanging fruits. They'll easily find easier places to hack. So to fight criminal attackers, you don't have to have perfect security. You just have to have a little bit better security than the other targets. But then when you are facing governments, the rules are different. Governmental attackers don't give up. If they can't get in, they will try again. If they still can't get in, they will try again. And if the attacker just never gives up, it's likely that sooner or later they will get in. And that makes them such a hard target or such a hard uh, enemy to fight when you are the target. And that means my friends and colleagues, 
that the times of building walls around our networks are over. We can't keep all the attackers out. Even if they're not governmental, if they are persistent enough, they will get in. If you have large enough network, they will get in. So we have to stop thinking about how we could build stronger walls and start focusing on what's happening inside of the walls. So we're able to detect when there's a breach, so we can respond when there's a breach. And if you think about how much the world changed during 25 short years, from my trip to Austria and renting a boat, and how it seems impossible to now understand how you could even do that without the internet. Well, we are facing exactly as large change in the future as well. The things we now take for granted will seem like ancient history in very short time. And that means that your job, my job, our job, is not to secure computers. Our job is to secure the society. Thank you for your work. Thank you very much. That was wonderful, Mika. That's one of the best opening keynotes we've had at all. So can I ask you a quick question? Here's a punch I, I, card for you. Yeah, thank you. In the, in, in the same way as you had that moment with your uh, younger colleague, I had one with my daughter. I was explaining to her, I was saying, probably the single thing that makes her life most different to mine, and I, I picked this up and I said that, that, that these things are now mobile. I said, in my day, phones were connected. And before I had a chance to say to the wall or to a desk or whatever, she hopped in and said, you mean like to your pants? <laughs> and I did just think, how cool would it have been that you're out one night going, that's what I'll call them. Oh, fuck, I'm not wearing my phone pants, damn. <laughs> but my, I, I use my phone a lot. My, my kids, it's like they're surgically attached. In the space of mobile, where are we at on security versus lack of security. Mm -hmm. Many people, uh, especially outsiders of our field, somehow believe that mobile devices like phones and tablets would be less secure than computers because, you know, they're smaller and, I don't know, easier to lose, things like that. But of course, these are more secure than real computers because they are much more restricted. The main restriction is the App Store or Play model. The idea that you can't just randomly write software and deploy and run it on every device. It has to go through checks before it's downloaded from an app store. And that really is the reason why we don't see malware on mobile devices. And that's why I am a bit worried about what's happening right now, especially about the fact that Apple is being taken into Supreme Court in the United States as they are being accused of monopoly model with the app store. And uh, they're right, it is a monopoly, but it's a secure monopoly. And if the end result of that is that App Store is killed and iPhone users will start downloading their applications from random websites, we will end up with exactly the same problems we used to have on our computers. When <clears throat> most people in this room obviously get it, and I presume their personal and work security <clears throat> is pretty high, when you're talking to that average person who just needs to be a little bit better, what's, what's the single thing? If you could do one thing with just your random person in there, home devices or work, what's the one thing someone can do to massively decrease their risk profile? It's quite depressing that we are in 2019 and we are still using passwords. Passwords which were invented pretty much when the in internet was invented, like, you know, 70s or something like that. It's way, way overdue to get rid of that. So my advice to the average person on the street is always password managers. Like, don't even try to manage your passwords because every single guidance and rule and helpful article in newspapers telling you how to pick a good password is always wrong because it's always the same goddamn advice about picking a really long and complex password. Uh, make sure it has lots of uppercase, lowercase numbers and punctuation and make sure it's completely different on every website and don't write it down, which is basically saying that, you know, come up with something that you absolutely can't remember but don't write it down. Obviously, you can't do that. The only way they can do it is password managers, and that's my tip number one. Great. I'm going to get you to sign oh. my punch cards. Right. On there. Give him another round of applause. That was just wonderful. <laughs> we'll be hearing from Mikko a little bit over the next couple of days.
Our next speaker, as I, I think um, Mike from uh, Ossert made clear, it's just not possible to put on a conference this big, this far-reaching, this in-depth, without tremendous support from sponsors. So here to say a few words on a very exciting title, the CISO and the Gunslinger, from our Platinum One sponsor, PSNC. Please welcome Michael McKinnon. Thank you. Good morning. So, um, I need your help. Chief Information Security Officer. It's, it's a very lengthy title, and it has this amazing acronym. And I work with a lot of CISOs, or CISOs, depending on how we pronounce it, through the work we do at Pure Hacking, Hack Lab, Securus Global, and Certitude, which are our major brands. And I have this quandary, how do we pronounce it? Is it CISO or is it CISO? And I thought, what better opportunity than to get your help and let's do a quick vote. If you think it should be pronounced CISO, can I see a show of hands? Oh, okay, okay. And if you believe it should be pronounced CISO, can you give me a show? Ah, CISO wins, excellent. Okay, so I think I've mostly been, been saying CISO, although I think I have been kind of um, alternating now and then anyway. So CISO it is, CISO, sorry, CISO it is. All right, so I was browsing my LinkedIn feed, which has kind of become like, I don't know, the Facebook of, of our industry in some ways, and there was a really amusing clip. Um, and some of you may have already seen this, but I want to play it and then let's have a discussion about what we see. So my reaction was very much the same when I first saw this video, and I kind of couldn't stop watching it. I had to keep replaying it and replaying it. And, and, the, and then all of these other things started to occur to me about this video. Like, first of all, why am I laughing? Like, why am I laughing at, at, at this misfortune, this incident? Um, and so what I thought is we have a bit of fun and actually kind of go through this and see if we can, can have a discussion about some of the points here. Because I think there's a lot of relevance about our industry that is contained in this simple video. Um, so let's talk about the, the CISO. Um, clearly, well, first of all, the first observation is we see this guy has a target painted on his chest. And that's not unlike a real CISO, is it, in some regards, right? And I want to clarify too that when we talk about this role of the Chief Information Security Officer, in some organisations they haven't formally recognised that role. There's no CISO as such. But what I would suggest to you is that the target is on someone in every organisation, whether they know it or not, the default CISO, if you like. So as I'm talking about this role and the CISO, have a think about people in your organisation who this might actually apply to, even though you might not formally recognise that, uh, that as a role. And then I started to think, well, hang on, why did he get shot in the leg? Like, what could we think about with the CISO about why this, this happened to, to him? And then I thought, well, there's a few different scenarios here. And so the first thing is, if we believe, kind of as a metaphor, that the CISO getting shot in the leg is more about the organisation or the enterprise suffering some kind of, of mishap, then it's a bit of, bit of an unfair representation to put it all on, on the CISO. And typically we see CISOs who have a team of people working with them to help protect the enterprise, don't we? And those team could consist of, of permanent staff, it could consist of contractors and... Um, outsource providers, could also consist of vendors. Then I thought, aha, the vendor. Maybe the vendor who provided the bulletproof vest kind of failed to disclose the fact that the protection stops about here, or, or, or here, or here, or here, right? They haven't kind of fully disclosed. So maybe that's one scenario. The other, the other scenario that's interesting is what I refer to as the CISO of overwhelm. 
You know the job ads, right? Wanted Chief Information Security Officer must have 80 years of strategic security management experience and manage networks and firewalls and have certifications in penetration testing. So these poor CISOs are overwhelmed and under-resourced and they're going to get shot in the leg often. This is a problem for them. Then we've got um, another type of, of CISO that I like to call the deputised CISO. And we work with some organisations um, that really are sort of getting to a point in their security journey where they've realised that they need a CISO, but they don't go out and, and hire one. They just sort of deputise, you know, oh, well, Bob's been here a long time, let's make him the CISO. And so poor Bob, he's just coming in, has no background perhaps in IT, he's very business focused, um, very good at governance and compliance, but doesn't really appreciate the technical aspects. And the metaphor for this situation is that Bob's getting shot in a leg he doesn't even know he has, because he has no visibility um, over, over the situation. Let's turn our focus now then to the penetration tester, the technical wizard who's going to discover the, uh, the exposure here of the, of the, of the leg that the CISO is not aware of. Um, and my first question here is, well, does this guy look like a penetration tester to you? We have a bit of a stereotype of penetration testers, don't we? The, the hooded type, uh, the, the teenager in the basement, um, if you will. So, you know, there's some interesting dynamics around what that stereotype can potentially do. And if we're going back and we're talking about those CISOs who may have missed um, the information, whether it be technical guidance, have they listened to the technical guidance provided by these experts, and is that stereotype um, holding us back? The other interesting thing about this is when the penetration tester, or this guy in the, in the video, pulls the trigger. Now, I showed this video to a whole bunch of people without the context of CISO and penetration tester. So they just saw the, the, the sketch. It's on YouTube. Um, it obviously doesn't have those labels on it, that context. Um, and the people who saw the video that way said to me, oh, this is an accident. This guy has pulled the trigger, but he's not looking, right? He doesn't know what he's actually doing. Um, then, I sh then when I show people the video with the context of CISO and penetration tester, they all say, oh, yeah, no, no, he knew what he was doing. This is deliberate. Um, so this is an interesting point about how we think about penetration testers, that everything they do is deliberate. But the fascinating thing about pen testing is, and yes, there's methodologies that are followed and, and, there's, and there's all this nice stuff the way it works, but there are absolutely vulnerabilities that are discovered completely accidentally sometimes. And so it's just the, the, the art of getting the penetration tester in to do the testing that, is, that may result in this, even though it's accidental. So accidental or not, you still learn some lessons along the way. And then it brings me to what I think is the most provocative part of what's going on here. And this is the fact that the CISO is standing there saying, come on, shoot me. I'm secure. It's this, it's this false sense of security that the CISO has that he's, nothing bad is going to happen. And we see this all the time. We see vendors, we see organisations sometimes make claims like, we have invented an unhackable product. We've got an unhackable network. It's this overconfidence that, that plays out. But it's playing out also in much more subtle ways where some people have this notion and this, this sort of, I guess, this beginner's kind of notion when you, when you start to look at security that somehow security should be absolute. And so there's this subtle problem that happens across boardrooms all over this country where the CISO, the, sorry, the CISO, sorry, the, I said it right the first time, the, the CISO will be presenting to the board and the director leans over the table and asks this question, are we secure? Are we secure? Now, if you're a parent and you've got particularly teenagers, you'll know that asking a question that's only going to warrant a yes or no answer is a very bad idea. So, we need to stop asking the question, are we secure? Because it has this inbuilt notion that security is an absolute. And we know that security is not an absolute. So the questions need to get better from the highest levels. 
And if you can start asking questions like how secure are we and recognise that your security posture falls onto a spectrum, which a lot of us know as, as industry professionals, but some people are still getting used to, then you know, that's, that's a real issue. There's a mobile phone or something going on there in the background. Um, So if we ask these better questions, one of the fascinating things that can happen is this uh, communication ripple that can happen, a sort of a communication ripple of inquiry that can happen from the boardroom all the way down through to the basement. So it can really change the dynamic of, of how we do security. And then, as we get near the end here, I want to talk about this main point here which I think is really sorely missed. And the fact we laugh at this guy's misfortune, we laugh at the CISO's misfortune, he's been shot in the leg, but he's the one who actually handed the weapon to the penetration tester. And so in our industry, and particularly in the theme of, of don't go it alone, there is this partnership that happens. And the CISO is giving permission to the penetration tester to be shot in the leg effectively, right? So, so, and this is a wonderful partnership, it's a wonderful type of engagement, even though the, the CISO in this example is a little bit um, overconfident about his security, um, he still ends up being shot in the leg. So, there's really a couple of points I want to leave in summary around here um, that, that I hope you got from this video, and that's it, that there is a target on someone in your organisation whether you, whether you know it or not. Make sure you find who that person is and give them all the resources and encourage that encouragement they need to succeed. And the other, one, the other point too is that if you're that person, um, then make sure you act on technical advice. Um, it's always better, even if you're, you've come from a background where you don't kind of acknowledge or you're not interested in technical opinion, make sure you really do um, you know, have, have, a, have a spirit of accepting it and working with it. Um, and remember that security is never absolute. There's always this gradient and this measure and we always want to work towards improving it. And remember one thing, that it's much better to get shot in the leg than it is to get shot in the head at the end of the day. And if, as a CISO, you have got all of your ducks in alignment and you're working towards working with these partnerships and you're not going it alone, then hopefully hopefully over time, you'll end up looking and your organisation will end up looking something like this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. We're going to give you a little gift. Miko, if you'd like to come to stage as well, we've got a gift for your presentation. Miko, back on stage for a second. Just quickly, we, you know, we're going to give you a little gift as a thank you. Uh, for those who've been to Ossert before know that we've done the gift thing before. We've often gave away a commemorative coffee cup one year, um, sample of Australian wine one year, did a cheese board one year. This year we've gone a little bit nerdy. And quick show of hands if you've done a bit of The Legend of Zelda in your time. Fantastic. Quick show of hands if you think you're a reasonable player of chess. But if you chess players, yeah, great, okay. Well, look at this. The Legend of Zelda chess set. It doesn't get much geekier than that. Miko, fantastic opening presentation. Mike, give them both a big round of applause for getting us off and running in 2019. The Legend of Zelda chess set. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Want to thank our sponsors, PSNC, on that occasion. All the other sponsors, simply not possible without your support. We're about to break for morning tea. Morning and afternoon tea will be served in the foyers out there on the conference floor. Lunch available in the Critique restaurant and poolside. After morning tea, we break into our concurrent sessions. They take place in this room, separated into two halves. If you're a bit confused, just hop on to your app. It's got all the details. And the veranda and hinterland rooms located around past the lifts and registration desk, again on this floor of the venue. Your app has all the details. Do some Lego, do some lock picking, do some lunch, and we'll see you back here at four o'clock. Please give Miko and Mike another big round of applause for kicking us off. Ozzer 2019, we're underway. We'll see you back here just before four o'clock. <laughs>